Welcome to episode six of Eye on Horror. I'm one of your hosts, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, is Jacob Davison. How you doing? Doing good. Happy to be here yet again. Uh, yet again. This is people are going to start talking about us. This is uh, six uh, by weeks in a row. Uh, and from Minneapolis, Minnesota, our road warrior Jonathan Korea. How you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, in the city of what the the Twin Cities? Yeah, there we go. The Twin City. The city that the city of the Vikings and the Wild and the Timberwolves and the Twins. And Mystery Science Theater three thousand. Mystery Science Theater. That 3000. is true. Mystery Science Theater three thousand is from here. And the Mall of the Americas is that still there? Uh, yeah, I haven't been to it yet. Uh, everyone keeps talking about it, but uh, yeah, I, it's still yet to do that. Instead, I decided to spend my day off watching movies and eating pizza. All right. Not that Minneapolis is known for its pizza, but eh, it was all right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let's get rolling. Um, what kind of news we got? The, since the last time we recorded, the big news that happened was last weekend, Margot Kidder passed away, mm. which is, is sad. Uh, she became an icon, a cinematic icon, with her portrayal of Lois Lane, in the 70s Superman, which is still my favorite superhero movie. Although I, I revisited it about a month and a half ago and it doesn't hold up. It's corny as hell, but I still love it. Uh, little eight-year-old me loved it. But uh, horror fans fell in love with Margot Kidder as Barb from Black Christmas mm -hmm. or even more so as Kathy Lutz from the Amityville Horror. And also as the, the dual role in Sisters, De Palma's Sisters, like early De Palma. But he was still very De Palmanian. Is that a word? De Palminian? Anyway, Margot Kidder, rest in peace. Yeah, she's definitely one of those uh, anomalies in cinema. I mean, she never was one of those like major, major uh, players, but she still had a major influence, was still in many iconic roles, um, and was never... You could never pinpoint her. Like, she was never a scream queen, but she's in some of the most classic horror films out there. But she also wasn't, you know, the damsel in distress or the uh, leading, major leading lady. But damn, because she could man a scene. And she will always be Barb from Black Christmas to me. I think that's probably my favorite role of hers. Just that raspy voice and that fuck you attitude that she has was just pitch perfect in that role she would have made a great scream queen had she gone in that direction with with both feet she i think she chose to go a little more cinematic route which worked for her because she had a very long career but she would have been a great scream queen had she done the uh you know the, the jamie lee curtis barbara crampton kind of thing mm -hmm. but hey i mean everybody knows her as lois lane so she did something right <laughs> and uh, did she do any other major horror movies? I don't know about movies, but she, I know that she was on uh, Tales from the Crypt, and mm. uh, I want to say Tales from the Dark Side, but I might be wrong there. She was on she was on a couple of uh, television shows, ah. but I don't know that she ever uh, went back to horror movies. I, I mean, I may be wrong there too. I you know may have lost track of her career in the later years but n nothing quite as classic as the amityville horror or black christmas <laughs> oh yeah she was in rob zombie's h2 that was one of her yes later roles she was she but rob zombie has a way of putting uh old icons into movies like that so i mean it, it's i mean i'm taking nothing away from you know the fact that she was in it but i mean he right. he seems he he's good at that he'll he'll pull out you know i mean lords of salem it seems like every face in that is from a 70s horror movie <laughs> you know? r.i.p margot kidder yeah margot kidder she will be missed uh, in other news there is a lot of blood on the decks uh this last week as far as television shows go because yes cancellations across board. The big one that horror fans are going to be upset about is The Exorcist. Mm. Um, but also Lucifer has been canceled, The Last Man on Earth, and I, uh, Marvel's Inhumans, I believe. And I think there are more. Uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. You know, there, there are other ones that aren't right. so horror-centric. Brooklyn Nine-Nine got picked back up by NBC. Like, that's how strong that fan base was. Well, people were pissed about Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Oh, yeah. I mean... I think that NBC filled a need because people were really upset. So maybe the same will happen with The Exorcist if people are vocal enough about it. But we all know from Ash vs. Evil Dead that horror television fans don't like to pay for their horror television. <laughs> mm. 
So yeah, Exorcist. Um, when it comes down to Exorcist, that really hit hard. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong. He, as we discussed before, huge Ash versus the Evil Dead fan. I mean, that's one of my favorite shows um, that was going on for a while. And it was a really funny and gross show, that's for certain. Uh, but The Exorcist was a totally different beast. I mean, the first season, they tied it into the original movie very well. Um, but it was more of like a horror drama than anything. And season two, man, they just really hit it um, from the get go. They it wasn't just, oh, here's the possession of the week. They really like stretched it out. And you really only had like two legit possessions the entire season, basically. And it really there was like some moments where it was some of the most amazing germotic moments that I've seen on TV in a really long time. I mean, major shout outs to John Cho. I mean, he absolutely killed it. There were, we were, my girlfriend and I were watching it every week and there were parts where we were just bawling our eyes out, um, with some of the material that they would cover with it. And it's really sad to see something like that go where it could have easily been like Damien, where it was just a simple cash in on a name of a, of a famous franchise, but they really took the concept and did something that was like, truly amazing with it and the fact that fox really kind of fucked it over um you know they kind of pulled like what they did to firefly they moved it to friday nights at like 10 or something uh the only reason we were able to keep up was because of hulu you know we were able to watch it like the next day um but man it just like circumstances of like a network giving up on it and letting it die and then going oh no don't know why it, why no one was watching. I guess people just don't like it. It's like, no, if you leave something out in the middle of a field, obviously no one's going to find it. But also at the same time, it's very little excuses. I mean, they do count DVRs. They do count views on Hulu. They count all these digital watches if you're watching a show legally. So if you missed out on this show, uh, then that that happens uh, who we all forget things are going on lord knows i've missed entire seasons of shows but if you're watching it on pirates bay we already covered this last week with ash versus the evil dead so you already know our opinions about pirate and current shows but uh you and you are part to blame but at the same time we really need to uh as horror fans make each other more aware of shows like this we need to really um, show people why these are amazing and not just clamor on about, oh, the blood's really good or something like that. We really need to show support to movies and shows that we love so that they can keep going. Because if we don't, this is going to continue to happen. Our favorite shows are going to keep getting canceled. Our favorite movies are just going to get buried under giant piles of, of the digital stack on Netflix or Hulu. And they're not going to be enjoyed. They're not going to be seen by other people. And they're not going to get sequels or second se or third seasons. Well said. And I admit I regret I didn't watch as much of uh, The Exorcist as I could have. I got into the, into the first season, didn't make it to the second in time. And, uh, yeah, no, just it was really well done. And... Uh, and yeah you know just handled the material as well and also I had to br uh, bring back what you are talking about with Damien like how many episodes did that one last like five oh, I, I I couldn't I couldn't even with that show like it just all of it looked so bad I think I lasted half an episode of Damien I mean I I have a pretty short attention span when it comes to television anyway so uh Damien I I it just didn't grab me um but The Exorcist, like you, Jacob, I was I I got through the first season and then the second season sitting on my DVR. So maybe I'm part of the problem. Although they do count DVR record recordings, and you know it's sitting there. I can't say that I was looking forward to where it was going to go after the second season because I haven't seen any of the second season yet. But I know that a lot of people loved it, and you know that's never bad. You know it's and as Brooklyn Nine Nine showed us. It may not be the end for The Exorcist if they can, you know, catch on with another network or possibly, you know, Netflix. If they can find someone who wants to pick it up, um, it might be a little more of a long shot than Brooklyn Nine-Nine because I think Brooklyn Nine-Nine had more of a cult following to it than something like The Exorcist. But hey, you know, never say never. Well, not to mention the legality of trademark with Exorcist. And, you know, ah, yes, that, that's true. That would make it a bit more difficult. But 
and it's never one person. Like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, fuck you, James and Jacob, for not actually watching <laughs> second season of Exorcist. <laughs> I mean, I am, but no. Um, <laughs> but that's the thing. It's, it's not one person. That's like saying, oh, my candidate didn't win because I didn't go out and vote today. It's a collective uh, thing. It's a collective guilt. So I maybe I'm, I'm guilty, too, because I didn't talk about Exorcist enough with people. I didn't show people. I didn't watch first season until – uh, it was all on Hulu, and my girlfriend said, hey, you watch The Exorcist show? I'm like, ugh, I can't. Not after Damien. I mean, I'm uh, sorry for those who worked on Damien. I'm sh- I hope you got paid uh, very good day rates, but oof. <laughs> <laughs> I had too many issues with that show. But anyways, um, but again, it's a collective thing. Again, go out, spread the word, support what you love. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> what uh... – do we, what other news? We got any other news going on this week? Uh, I got some casting updates on It Chapter Two. Yes. Nice. Yes. Let's get. Let's let's hear them. First off, we got Andy Bean as Sam Urus. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. We also got uh, James Ransom as Eddie uh, Kasprak. Um, Which that is that one's genius because if you they I saw somewhere online they had the picture of the kid who play who played that character next to James Ransom and um. It, 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 he looks like a grown up version of that kid that f- at least from a physical resemblance that casting is genius well that's with all the ones that they've announced so far like all of them yeah. have looked exactly like them as adults like there's no yeah. you know suddenly wait how did that kid turn into John Ritter you know with, like with the original <laughs> but like <laughs> they, they've been doing a really good job at least with physical casting I mean I'm not too familiar with uh, Andy Bean or James Ranson's work um, as like actors, you know James Ranson. James Ranson is deputy so and so in the Sinister movies. Yeah, uh, see, I never got into the Sinister movies. Oh, okay. Mm. He was in. He was in Tangerine. I don't know if you remember seeing that. That that mm. the, the other movie shot on iPhone that wasn't done by Steven Soderbergh. Oh, um, that's so long ago. You probably know Ranson's work, even if you don't know his face. Yeah, and. Uh... And that aside, we also have uh, Jessica Chastain as Beverly Marsh. Another genius one. Yeah, and, like, she fought for that role. Like, she, like, uh, pursued it, and she got it, so good for her. Well, she's worked with uh, with Andy Muschietti before on uh, Mama. Oh, uh, love Mama. I love everything except for the last five minutes of Mama. You could kind of <laughs> see that casting choice coming down Broadway, you know, you're, because not only is there a huge physical resemblance, um, but there's also the the uh, the history between the director and the star. So that one th- that's a, that one's a great casting choice too, in my opinion. But it's also weird thinking of Jessica Chastain uh, having to fight for a role. I mean, gosh, she's such a great actress. I mean, she made Molly's Game absolutely watchable, which that was the most Aaron Sorkin thing that has ever heard <laughs> Sorkin in the history of Aaron Sorkin and it didn't feature you say that like it's a bad thing no Aaron Sorkin I'm is not. a master of the written language I know but there wasn't a single scene of them walking and talking down a hallway I was blown away I was like this is the most Aaron Sorkin thing I've ever seen and not one shot was them walking <laughs> and her being like all right you go get those gamblers over there and you go get the cards from over there and don't forget to get the chips back there as they're going down a hall it was it was more of like it, it, it sounds insulting. I mean, I would never insult Aaron Sorkin, but man, is it a tour when it comes to writing. So the fact that someone let him actually direct um, made it even more so. I, I loved Molly's Game, and Jessica Chastain is amazing. So I can't wait to see her in it, Chapter Two. And lastly, uh, so far confirmed, we have uh, James McAvoy as Bill and Bill Hader as Richie. James McAvoy is my boy, Rob <laughs> of the Oscar. Hopefully, he he takes home the I Horror Award for what movie, James? Split. <laughs> oh, you saw Split, James. Did you? Did you know? I saw a Split. I don't remember who the leading actor was. Oh, okay. oh, oh I think you. I think you James do. James McAvoy and Split, best performance of last year. God uh, and Bill Hader. I don't know if you guys, if either of you guys saw Skeleton Twins. Um, he's more than just a not ready for t- primetime player. He's <laughs> uh, he is quite a dramatic actor too. So that that's a good choice too. This this these adult kids, the Adult Losers Club, is shaping up to be quite an ensemble, which is great because. Both in the book and the original miniseries, the adult bit was probably the mo- least interesting bit of the entire 
uh, story of it. So it's good that they're at least getting like a really solid cast together to uh, really bring that out. Yeah, it definitely was the weaker part of the 90s miniseries. I don't know if I would say that about the book. Uh, but it definitely was the weaker half in the uh, of the miniseries. So yeah, no, I, I'm very excited with um, Bill Hader as uh, Richie because um, again, you know, he's really showing range. Like I've been loving him on the season of uh, Barry on HBO because it's a dramedy where he plays a uh, hitman who wants to uh, become a, a Hollywood actor. So yeah, just he's. He's got the skills, and uh, like I've loved a lot of his stuff, and it'll be interesting to see him be kind of a, as uh, it's safe to say, a comic relief of the group. He, yeah, he, he's got those chops too, but I'm hoping that they don't uh, lean on that for him too much. I mean, I, I'm hoping that they do let him spread his dramatic wings too, because he's got chops. I mean, both comedic and dramatic. So he, yeah. I think, I think that's a good choice for for Richie. Yeah, he also does an amazing job of the hut impression. If you've ever, <laughs> if I can recommend That's people true. do one thing tonight is look that up. It's incredible. <laughs> uh, do we got any other news? Um, that Predator trailer that was dropped. The Predator trailer. Yes. There you go. Christ, was that trailer fucking awesome. <laughs> like, I mean, we've all known that Shane Black was coming back and directing a um, Predator movie, and he was bringing Fred Decker on to co-write it with him, which is awesome because, first of all, I'm just glad Fred Decker is getting more work because, Jesus Christ, he hasn't... Hell yeah. We haven't seen much from him since, what, Star Trek Enterprise when he was, like, uh, on for, like, maybe a season or two as, like, a producer, I think, maybe? I mean, and he hasn't directed anything since RoboCop 3, but, I mean, Night of the Creeps and Monster Squad are so close to my heart so it's great to see him back in the fold and he's working with a you know long time collaborator and friend Shane Black but holy shit that trailer was just phenomenal it had mm -hmm. every Shane Black trope in the beginning with the kid and just the action the little snippets we see are awesome and you could definitely tell that they had a really good grasp on not only the mythology of the Predators but like uh, about the like history and like where it should be going like predators the mm. robert rodriguez produced film was pretty good and it was pretty founded in its mythology but it kind of it fell flat for a lot of reasons so i'm excited for us to finally have like a really good predator sequel even though i do love predator 2 if only for its cheese and it's amazing original poster oh yeah even the first predator was cheese I mean, yeah. in all the best the, the, ways. The, what's the iconic image from the first Predator? It's these two muscle-bound arms in this, you know, bro yeah. shake. Yeah. <laughs> you son Locking of a bitch. Off. Jesse Ventura just chewing up every scene literally with his tobacco and just going, I don't have time to bleed. <laughs> if anybody cares, uh, one of my late-to-the-party uh, features for iHorror was on Predator because I just saw it for the first time maybe a year ago. What? And and I talk a little bit about the uh, the broness of the whole movie because it's uh, it's so bro. -y. It's oh, it's, yeah. it's like the <laughs> it ultimate bromance is. movie that ends with every almost everyone being no, just about everyone's killed in that. Yeah, yeah. Spoilers. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's <laughs> well, like most creature features <laughs> that come in the clothing of a slasher movie. Uh, yeah, that's, I don't really consider that a spoiler. <laughs> and back on the Predator 2 connection, like, I love that they got Jake Busey to play the son of Gary Busey's character from Predator 2 in this one. Yes. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, so he's, like, out for revenge against the Predators for killing his father, Gary Busey. Well, who else is going to play Gary Busey's, uh, son. kid? Yeah. No one can. <laughs> like, no one can, no one's face can make that type of just whatever the Busey's faces do. <laughs> and I, I can't describe it, but it's it's just like... Just, it's a grin. It's, there's teeth just everywhere, and it's <laughs> amazing, and I love them both for it. Um, another trailer that dropped, uh, Happy Time Murders, uh, which I wasn't too impressed by the trailer, but I am super excited that Brian Henson is making another movie. Brian Henson, of course... Uh, Jim Henson's son, who directed the amazing uh, Muppet Treasure Island, is 
uh, has now made an adult murder mystery involving puppets. What do you guys, how do you guys feel about it? I'm wondering how controversial it's going to be because it's got Muppets doing very un-Muppet things. I mean, it, you can tell just from the trailer that if you haven't seen the trailer, go see it because it, it it's hard to imagine this movie's not going to get an NC-17 just it's... from some of the stuff that's in this trailer. Uh, Melissa McCarthy's pretty hot right now. She's got... Um, I mean, I think she's got three high-profile movies this year. So um, between that and the gimmick of having Muppets, uh, I think people will see it just purely out of curiosity. I don't know how well it'll do after that, but it's definitely got some buzz. I think it looks pretty interesting, and I mean, a lot of people are throwing around the Meet the Feebles uh, comparisons, but I really think this is going to stand it on its own, you know, both by being a murder mystery and, you know, it's the actual Muppet Studio who made the Muppets are actually doing this. So yeah. there's there's just there's a huge novelty to that. And yeah, no, the, uh, the trailer was really good, but the end of the trailer... Uh, correct me up. I I won't say what happens at the end of the trailer because you got to see it for yourself. Let's just say a mess was made. <laughs> yeah. It it seems more like like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit scenario than anything from Meet the Feebles. You know, only yeah. it's yeah. Muppets instead of cartoons. Right. But um, it but it looks like it's just understood that Muppets and people are coexisting, mm. and yeah. there's and there's a mystery to solve. So. Yeah, it'll 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 be interesting. We'll we'll uh, we'll keep an eye on that one. Yeah, I mean, it's he, Brian Henson has been trying to make this movie for over, well over a decade, I believe, at this point, right? Yeah, been his pet project. Yeah, so it, it'll be cool to see uh, how that turns out. I I know uh, the trailer didn't you know strike me as anything super amazing, but I'm still excited for it. I mean, Lord knows I need more mu more movies involving puppets and humans. I mean, it's been how many years since the last <laughs> Muppets movie and since the Muppets went off the air, so uh, we're yeah. definitely due for some more Muppet mayhem. Let's move to some new releases. I have a few things that, that I've seen. Uh, the closest thing to horror that I've seen is Breaking In. It's the big Mother's Day release from last weekend. It's basically panic room. You know, this woman, uh, her father dies, so she inherits his house, and she brings her kids up to it to um, to get it ready to sell. And there's a gang of thieves that have broken in, and they want something in the house. So she ends up, she turns into ninja mom, literally, to fight these guys. And that's the the thing. It, it's 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 a lot like panic room, but it doesn't have the subtle intricacies of panic room and it um they're so heavy-handed about you know she escapes and her kids are trapped there so the the crooks are like she's not going anywhere she's a mom and we've got her kids and it, it's just so you know it, it's just it, it's just schlock um it's kind of fun it's got a great score it's not really the kind of score like a john williams one where you're going to leave the theater singing it but it just ratchets up the tension so you can't really relax which is what that kind of a movie needs so that was breaking in. And then also I saw a movie called Beast, which Korea, everything mm -hmm. you didn't like about Thoroughbreds, I, you need to see Beast because Beast, it reminded me of Thoroughbreds, except without all of those hot topic t-shirt slogan things that you had a problem with. Um, it's basically about a girl who uh, she meets a guy and starts dating him and then she uh, slowly starts to suspect that he might be this serial killer that is plaguing her little town. And it's, you know, and, and then it goes places from there. But I think it's everything that you expected from Thoroughbreds but didn't get. So you check out Beast. And the other new release thing that I saw that, that you guys, I don't think you guys did, because we've got a couple that the three of us all saw that we're going to talk about. Um, it's, a, it's a documentary, not really horror, but it's called Film Worker. Mm -hmm. Are you guys familiar with Film Worker? No. No. It's about a guy whose name is Leon Vitali, and he was Stanley Kubrick's right-hand man. Um, he first worked with him. It, actually, he talks about in the movie how he saw Clockwork Orange, and he's like, I need to work with this guy. So he auditioned for Barry Lyndon and got a role in Barry Lyndon. And then he went on to basically... Anything Stanley Kubrick needed for the rest of his career, this guy would do. He was the guy who cast Danny for The Shining, and then he became his handler on set. Um, he was 
R. Lee Ermey, is that his name? The drill yeah. sergeant from Full Metal yeah. Jacket? Yep. He was his acting coach. He would make him run through his lines. And also he was the acting, or not really the acting coach, but the line runner for the um, the helicopter door gunner, <laughs> who only has like one scene, but it's an awesome one. Right, because that's who R. Lee Ermey replaced, the actor who was originally yes, the drill sergeant yeah, it, became it, the helicopter pilot. Exactly. As his consolidation prize. And they actually have, they have an interview with the guy where he talks about that, and he seems a little salty. But then he also embraced his role as the helicopter door gunner. So he he kind of got over it. But basically anything like if, if they needed a restoration of 2001, Vitali would go and do it. And he would, um, you know, he, he basically became kind of like Stanley Kubrick's bitch, kind of, but not really because he loved doing it. Everything he would do for the guy. And the reason Kubrick kept him around is you get the impression that he knew that if he entrusted something to this guy, he would do it and do it correctly. So he, I mean, he would, they were, he was telling stories about how he had him clean in his, his house, you know, because he knew it'd be done right. Um, it, to the point where he actually goes into how he basically finished eyes wide shut because Kubrick died. And they're like, well, okay, we need to get this movie finished. How are we going to finish it? You know, so they entrusted post-production on Eyes Wide Shut to Leon Vitale. And it's really interesting. You know, the, the Shining parts were probably the most interesting, will be the most interesting to horror fans. But anybody who's into filmmaking at all and who recognizes the genius that is Stanley Kubrick, uh, film worker is well worth checking out. Oh, yeah. And I mean, for such a maniac of a perfectionist like Kubrick was, for him to trust a guy, like, you know, to do anything especially that much is pretty astounding and it would make sense that Kubrick would put that much responsibility on one person like he's like all right I trust this guy he's gonna do everything that's basically the impression you get is that Kubrick found a guy he could count on to do it correctly and he would do everything like he would like you know he was changing the aspect ratio gates on the cameras and you know he's you know doing color grading on the movies you know he basically anything Kubrick's told him to do he would figure out how to do it and he would do it to Kubrick's liking. So this guy, obviously, you know, that's no small task. So it's a, it's a pretty cool little, uh, little documentary about that guy. I mean, it's, it's about, it's about Leon Vitale, but you get a huge glimpse into Stanley Kubrick's life through him. So it's, it's, it's really, really well made. And every film student is going to watch that film before (laughs) their freshman year. Of course. They should. They they absolutely should. <laughs> what have you seen, Jacob? Um, well, on the horror front, uh, I'm not sure if you guys seen this. I saw uh, the Endless. Which uh, did either of you guys see uh, that movie from 2012, Resolution? Yes, I yeah i I saw Resolution and the Endless. We we talked about it a, a few episodes ago. Where uh, how, how the two? You don't want really to go into spoilers, but yeah, if, yeah. if you've seen. If you've seen Resolution, The Endless is going to be that much sweeter. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's same directors, Justin Benson and Aaron Scott Moorhead. And uh, yeah, th- so they do they do make some interesting connections. Uh, but yeah, The Endless is basically about uh, these two guys, uh, these two brothers who were a part of some doomsday UFO cult. And uh, 10 years after they leave, they get a tape uh, telling them uh, to come back for some kind of ascension. They do, and things seem kind of normal, but weird shit starts going down and they got to figure stuff out. And uh, yeah, in terms of cosmic horror, like, you know, especially the Lovecraft episode, it's very hard to nail, but these guys always do. And also it had one of the funniest and most entertaining forms of kind of uh, cosmic exposition I've ever seen in a movie. Again, no spoilers, but it is definitely well worth watching. Yeah, I, I enjoyed The Endless a lot. I don't know if it'll make top five, but that you know says more about the caliber of movies I'm seeing than it does The Endless, because The Endless is uh, is pretty good. Totally agree. Uh, Jonathan, yeah. did you see anything good? Uh, on the horror front, no. I've really only had one day off, or I had two, but I spent one sleeping. But I did manage to go out uh, to theaters, which is a rare uh, treat for myself, but I did see a double feature of Josh Brolin movies where he plays <laughs> uh, comic book characters. Uh, the other night I comic saw... Comic book villains. Yeah. Well, villains for the most part. Um, I did go out and see uh, Deadpool opening night as well as finally seeing Infinity War. Um, First of all, no spoilers, but Infinity War 
was exactly what it needed to be. It's no masterpiece. Hell yeah, it was. That's for certain. Uh, but as a film where it's 10 years of Marvel movies being wrapped up into one, I mean, they did a really good job of seamlessly uh, going from these very different uh, films, even though they're all part of the uh, Marvel films. You know, the Captain America films are very different from the Guardians of the Galaxy films, which are different from Black Panther. But they seem to uh, find a nice way of like tying them all together like when they went to guardians you knew we were going into guardians because suddenly they were playing an 80s classic and it just (laughs) said space as a subtitle um (laughs) which i thought was hilarious um but yeah i mean jesus christ uh that ending like just oh it's been a while since i cried in a theater and to cry at a marvel movie made me even feel more so but yeah it was definitely 17 out of 18 marvel films wrapped up into one because no ant man so um it's probably like the (laughs) one movie you can watch without you know missing out for this i mean you should still watch i had a lot of fun with ant-man but yeah infinity war was great josh brolin honestly i don't think anyone else could have brought thanos to life like jesus christ he made an amazing thanos Uh, just like his performance was really really well done for especially for a c mostly cg character like that Mm-hmm. The the thing about it is, um, like like you touched on, you knew when you were going to Gal- Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, I mean, a lot of credit has to go to the Russo brothers for that because they seamlessly combined eighteen other movies into one, you know, the, and and they only would do uh, the Captain America movie, you know, and Civil mm-hmm. War I think was a pretty good primer for that, but they jumped to the Guardians of the Galaxy with it may as well have been James Gunn directing because it was such a seamless transition to those characters and. That that, not not just the characters, but that vibe. You know, y- it felt like a Guardians of the Galaxy movie. You know, when when they're uh, concentrating on Thor, it felt like Thor. Right. Th- those guys did a really good job. It, they're they're very versatile filmmakers, I think, and not just from an imitation standpoint. Which, but although it kind of you you do feel like they were imitating James Gunn on Guardians of the Galaxy, but that's what that part of the movie needed. Needed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so which I was surprised there was no like Sin City esque like with special guest director James Gunn, you know, um, <laughs> like I'm yeah. really surprised they didn't do that. But also at the same time, he's already busy with like writing and producing other films, not to mention working on Guardians Three. Uh, yeah. but, well, also Gunn, um, I, I'm wondering. I mean, I don't think he went in and did any directing. Probably consulted him. He is a producer on the movie too, and he was the one who, when people were asking what. You know, I mean, I don't want to spoil anything, but people were asking him on social media about a certain line of the movie. That's one of Groot's lines. And all he says is, I am Groot. But I guess in the script that uh, Vin Diesel gets, it tells you the meaning, what, you know, what he actually says. I don't know if he had a hand in writing it, but he it definitely went through him because he knew to answer people's questions. Oh, yeah. Which is weird that they would ask James Gunn and not the Russos. But hey, if you you go to the source, if you want Groot knowledge. Yeah. Yep. And such a huge film. It was one of the smaller moments. But uh, Scarlet Witch's and Vision's relationship mm-hmm. was absolutely yep. beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that was my favorite character as a kid growing up. I found an action figure of him one day. No knowledge of him but i was like man this guy looks really cool i've never seen a superhero with these type of colors or this type of look before and so i bought the action figure came with the comic book bought more comic books and just fell in love with you know this android who was created for evil but really you know was trying to you know not only discover himself but discover what it was like to become human and in his pursuit became you know more human than most and his relationship in the comics to Scarlet Witch really solidified that. And it was uh, really well done in the movie. I mean, granted, you know, it kind of quickly goes away as, you know, the Thanos and every and his children come in and quite literally fuck everything up. But it was great to finally see that on a screen, especially since that was something that I know for me as a comic book fan never thought would make it to the screen. So I'm glad that they took the time to really develop that relationship further. Um, but yeah, Infinity War was awesome. Let's put it that way. Yeah. But was also awesome was Deadpool 2. Deadpool 2. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> so goddamn funny. Oh, man. When most people say that a sequel is more of the same, it's usually something of an insult. But with this one, it, nah. 
it, yeah it, it, it is what it is i mean if you didn't like deadpool you probably won't like deadpool too if you love deadpool you're gonna love deadpool too it's more of the same the action was tighter felt more john wicky uh which of course you get one of the directors of john wick to do it it's gonna the action is gonna be tight and fast and but it's still matrixy though it still goes into that halftime yeah you know that slow-mo you know so so basically you can see what deadpool's doing because his reflexes are so fast, yeah. Well, you got to make sure you get certain stuff in slow motion. I mean, did you get yeah. that in slow motion? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the meta humor was really on point. And, uh, again, won't spoil it, but just some of the jokes were, as simply put, incredible. And that they managed to pull them off. So, yeah, just really funny, great action. And also, I love the cast, especially uh, yes. some of the new characters they added, like Zazie Beats as uh, Domino from the comics. Absolutely perfect casting there. Oh, my God. They are spot on and just um, and portraying the luck powers and kind of that Rube Goldberg uh, type of way with like little things around her, uh, like breaking down or crashing and to her advantage. And uh, so I was actually kind of thinking she's bit, her superpower is that she's the final destination. Yep. Yeah. To her enemies. <laughs> Did you guys notice Brad Pitt? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's the vanisher. He, now it's it's funny. I mean, and this isn't really a spoiler because you know that Deadpool forms X Force. But yeah, uh, Brad Pitt plays the vanisher, and he's invisible for all but just a few frames, not even a whole second. But it's funny because you he's he's not cre- he's credited in the closing credits, but he wasn't credited on on IMDb. So when you see the glimpse of the vanisher, you're like, was that Brad Pitt? <laughs> and then you <laughs> hang out for the credits, and you're like. That was Brad Pitt. <laughs> More like that was Brad fucking Pitt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which another thing is uh, with, with Deadpool 2, um, I'll save you the time. You don't have to sit through all of the credits because there's no uh, post credits. There's a mid credits scene that you absolutely have to see, though, because it is uh, it's very Deadpoolian. You know, it's oh, yeah. hilarious. And <laughs> and continuing with like just the great casting, they also did a great job of just showing uh, different characters. I mean, um, you know, Domino not only had luck, which could be a very lazy, um, you know, power to write in. It's just like, oh, everything works away. But she actually really kicked ass. She was a very strong female character um, who also had um, vitiligo. I mean, uh, as someone who does have vitiligo myself, I you never see superheroes with that. And that's how they made her iconic uh, diamond shape on her face was with vitiligo. So I thought that was really cool. Um, but not only that, even even more significant is we probably we saw her probably the at least in the X Men universe the very first LGBTQ um, couple in mm-hmm. a superhero movie with um, Negasonic Teenage Warhead and Yukio. Yukio, there we go. Yeah, Negasonic t- Teenage Warhead finally finds a uh, significant other, and it's Yukio, who's this very nice uh, Japanese girl, and it was so fucking funny, her interactions with Deadpool, because every scene, she would go, hi, Wade, and then he would stop whatever he's doing and just turn and go, hi, Yukio. Even at the very <laughs> end, like, when he parts ways with them, like, he leaves the room and she just goes, bye, Wade, and he just pokes his head around the corner and goes, bye, Yukio. And it was just (laughs) the cutest interactions. And when the relationship is introduced to Deadpool, he's in shock and she goes, oh, what? You're against this? He's like, whoa, stop there, Fox and Friends. (laughs) Pump the brakes, Fox and Friends. Yeah, that was your favorite line, right, James? Yeah, that was my favorite line. Pump the brakes, Fox and Friends. I just can't believe anybody could stand you enough to be in a relationship with you. Which was perfect because that's totally just, you know, a friend instantly accepting and just immediately shitting on them, but not because (laughs) of the type of relationship they're in, just that they're in a relationship, which I thought was really great. He was right. He's like, he's all, I can't believe anybody would want to be with her. (laughs) That was my favorite line just because, you know, just if I'm going to start saying that, pump the brakes, Fox and friends. (laughs) And also yeah. when he when he called her eleven, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was good too. <laughs> Bringing it back to horror with Stranger Thing reference, yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, we, yeah. We, in case you haven't noticed, we're 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 going into some fringe horror here with these superhero movies, but they're fanboy enough, and y- you you guys <laughs> like them, so we're yeah. we're talking about them. Oh, I have a comic where uh, Deadpool uh, regrets that he dr- didn't dress up as Freddy Krueger for Halloween, like he's uh, with Hawkeye, and he thinks that Deadpool's just a dude in Freddy Krueger costume. He's like, 
Damn, I should have been Freddy Krueger for Halloween. God, that would be a perfect costume for him, wouldn't it be, as Vern Victim? <laughs> uh, well, to bring it back to horror, I mean, Negasonic Teenage Warhead is in season two of Exorcist, if that doesn't motivate everyone to watch it. She was also in Tragedy Girls. Ooh, I haven't seen that one. I didn't realize. Yeah, she's she's one of the Tragedy Girls, so she Ooh. has hair in Tragedy Girls, so... Oh, uh, yeah, that's, it's a little... that's what threw me. <laughs> that's what threw <laughs> So uh, what else have you guys seen? I haven't seen much outside of that, but I am very excited for uh, the new Netflix movie Cargo starring Martin Sheen. Mm. Or no, not Martin Sheen, yeah. sorry. Martin Freeman. No, uh, the other Martin. Yes, Martin Freeman. <laughs> uh, yeah. Fresh off of Ghost Stories, Martin Freeman. Yeah, it looks mm-hmm. really good. It's based off of a uh, short film, and the short film's about a um, – it follows this man who becomes a zombie with his um, – newborn child still like and it's baby carrier on its back so it goes over like the themes of of uh, parental instinct even when one is a zombie so it'll be interesting to see how that's turned into a feature length film because that's one of those concepts where it's like eh, can that really be stretched to 90 minutes you know should it be stretched to 90 minutes but I think with a powerhouse actor like Martin Freeman I think they would be able to pull it off hopefully well I know that Jacob has seen something because he and I have a deal where oh, he yeah. doesn't spoil Heredity for me, and I don't <laughs> spoil Solo for him. Yeah. <laughs> I just need to know one thing about Heredity. I just need to know. And and if you say any more, I'm taking the headphones off. Uh, does it live up to the hype? I would say it does. Nice. It genuinely right. was one creepy, scary as hell movie. And, uh, you know, like some of the buzz around is like it's this generation's Exorcist, but I think, I think it can live up to you that. You hear that every year, though. Yeah, I know, but in just terms of aesthetic, like, again, I don't want to go into it, but there are reasons why yeah. people are saying that. So, um... Uh, okay. I can't wait. Yeah, no, I, I it will be well worth the wait. My screening seems to be after everybody else's. I'm waiting until the end of this month, which is still a week before release, but, ah, everybody's seen it before me. But... Um, and this will this will be out by the time this episode posts. But I saw Solo, and all I'll say about Solo is if you like the newer Star Wars movies, you know, like like The Force Awakens and Rogue One, all that, you'll be into Solo. It's more of that kind of thing. I'm I'm a pretty soft critic when it comes to Star Wars movies. I mean, if you just put Chewbacca up on a wall with moving pictures, I'm like, yeah, Chewie. You know, <laughs> I the, the little seven year old Jay is is in heaven, and he was in heaven for this. You know, it's. it's it's pretty much what you expect from a standalone Star Wars movie that is an origin of Han Solo movie. So, yeah, I don't want to I don't want to spoil any more of it than that. Yeah, please don't cuz even with all the turmoil that we've heard behind the scenes with Solo, I'm how could you not be excited to see Han Solo on the screen again even if it's not Harrison Ford, you know? It's, yeah. Yeah, it's it, it it's funny cuz the turmoil behind the scenes it seems to have been confined to behind the scenes because it's a very coherent movie. And I don't know how much of the of the Lego movie guys uh, storytelling ended up on screen. Mm-hmm. It looks like it's probably more Ron Howard than them. If they yeah. even did not they may have reshot everything that those guys did. But um, mm-hmm. no, it's it's good. I mean, you know, no one needs my recommendation on solo I and mean, people a know if they're going to see it and b they're probably going to see it <laughs> mm-hmm. know, i mean i think it's already you know breaking records in pre-sale but you you won't be disappointed star wars fans won't be disappointed with it and james don't feel bad about your viewing of hereditary just remember i'm always going to see something weeks after <laughs> you guys no matter no i'm surprised yeah. i saw deadpool before jacob did so <laughs> it's a rare occurrence. I think it was only hours before, though, because you're you were in a time zone ahead yeah. of him. Though, <laughs> I think you guys saw it. At, I think you guys both saw it opening day. You just happened yeah. to be uh, three hours in the future. <laughs> Which, speaking of time zones and Deadpool, I'm sorry to backtrack, but being in Minnesota, specifically in Minneapolis, for that one oh, yeah. line about <laughs> Minneapolis's famous glory hole in the bathroom <laughs> stall of the Air international airport was incredible. Just seeing a room full of people collectively go, oh, they mentioned Minneapolis in a movie for once. We are in a movie. <laughs> like it was, it was wonderful. 
um, I'm truly grateful to have experienced that. All right. Anything else we see, or can we move on to? Uh... Yeah, let's move on to the topic. Well, not not the topic. We've got we have a Jacob oh, yeah. subgenre of the bye week. Indeed. What do we got for our subgenre? Uh, well, um, since we were talking about Predator and with Memorial Day weekend coming up, I thought uh, it would. The best topic or best subgenre topic of the bye week would be uh, military horror. Uh, you know, a horror that uh, f- prominently features uh, the army or armed service or uh, s- such, uh, usually fighting monsters. Uh, and I wanted to start by talking about perhaps the quintessential and classic uh, military horror movie, Aliens. Uh, featuring the Space Marines going to LV-426 to fight the Xenomorphs. And, of course, featuring, I think, one of my favorite Aliens characters, Private Hudson, portrayed by the great late uh, yeah. Bill Paxton, who gave us the immortal line, Game over, man. Game over. Uh, but, yeah, and just... Um you know, Aliens, uh, you know, uh, was like the amazing sequel to Alien and they actionized it, but still made it scary, even though it was, you know, featuring heavily armed space Marines, uh, you know, because it had the claustrophobia element to it. And uh, the movie was, of course, written and directed by James Cameron, who put in, you know, uh, his take on, on kind of, uh, you know, like using the story as a metaphor for the Vietnam War and that the space Marines are heavily armed and well trained, but uh, the uh, the the xenomorphs with their abilities and being in their environment like are able to come up on top in the beginning like hudson it calls himself you know such a badass and they get whooped so bad that like he's basically in tears and does not want to fight the xenomorphs when i think of, of military horror i always think of the the ones that are uh that kind of concentrate on the guys that come back from war like death dream is oh, one yeah. of my favorites um, and it's it's basically Death Dream is is kind of sad because it's it's basically about a soldier who his family thought that he was killed in Vietnam, and then all of a sudden he shows up and it turns out he's like a zombie kind of a you know thing so he's not he didn't really come back, you know those kind of movies that and and ones like Jacob's Ladder which is about another Vietnam you know survivor who comes back and has these terrible visions and you know where 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 he does the what what do you call it Korea the um. The, the 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 stop the shaky head what did you call that we we think that Jacob's ladder was the first one to do it uh, but the thirteen ghosts thing so like the shaky head the, 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 the frames the yeah, yeah. <laughs> the drying dog face motion or drying dog face was so Doctor Strange does it in uh, in Infinity War for a second oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the oh man, I had a good term shift. for it the other day. I know you did. You called it something I don't remember. Mm. It wasn't shaky head, but it was something like well, it. it'll come back to you. Yeah, it'll be like five minutes after we record this. Suddenly, I'll text you yeah. guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, you know those movies are really great, and uh, and of course again because all things must go back to Rampage, as we've stated, and I think has become the uh, podcast motto. Uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of like monster movies where the army has to fight the monster. You know, like is going as far back as like uh, Godzilla and movies and American movies like Them, which features the army fighting giant radioactive ants. To today with uh, Rampage, you know it's. Just all it's always cool, uh, you know, having a horror movie with a giant monster and, uh, you know, seeing the army try and fight it off. And uh, especially back with like 50s and 60s uh, B movies, because in those movies, the army would always suggest using a nuke to take out the monster, or whatever, <laughs> you know, I, I, which I guess is, you know height of the cold war and metaphors for a time it's just it happened in all of them like let's see it conquered the world uh the uh, roger corman b movie where with the mind controlling eggplant from, v- from venus or whatever like you know just the best solution nuke it and that leads into my favorite type of uh military movies which are the ones where it's um like military but it's not war like it's a military response to an extreme situation so a bit like with the monsters i mean you look at stuff where it's like return of living dead where you don't see the military brought in until the very end and they fight for like a good five minutes and then they immediately go all right nuke it done (laughs) it's like it's a long process you know that's a very long sequence of them waking up a man from his sleep and he puts in the keys and puts in the right coordinates and everything but it just shows like the uttermost mundane presentation and um steps it takes to 
destroy an entire city full of people and zombies as well. Not to mention the humor of the, oh, yes, it went off successfully. I mean, there's acid rain and reports of people burning for the rain, but that will pass over. Um, <laughs> and another great film that shows that is 28 Days Later. You know, this oh, yeah. weather, I believe it was filmed before 9-11, but it came out after. And it definitely was in that zeitgeist of post 9-11 um, films, especially horror of just showing, you know, the military in this extreme situation where um, there is very little um, surveillance on them and very little, you know, direction given to these soldiers who are just caught in this extraordinary an extreme situation and what happens when the power has shifted and suddenly they're in control of these people with no one above them and their worst signs come out. And that's always been um, that psychology behind it is very intriguing to me. And plus 28 days later is absolutely a great m- movie overall, even if yeah. you can only watch like three quarters of it in 720, I think maybe 480. <laughs> mm. And opposite of that, like on the more schlockier side of things, like one of my favorites is uh, Uncle Sam, the uh, Larry Cohen movie, uh, yeah. yes. which has the most patriotic and insane premise I think I've ever heard in that uh, it takes place co- post Gulf War. And this guy, Sam, is a soldier and he dies. Uh, he was, like, so patriotic and so crazy that he came back from the dead at his hometown's 4th of July festival. And he kills a dude dressed as Uncle Sam for the festival. And he puts on the costume and he's, like, a zombie wearing an Uncle Sam costume. And he starts killing anybody who's unpatriotic or disrespects the flag. So it's, uh, you know, Larry Cohen, so it's a bit overt on the message, but it's just fun as hell to watch uh that just jumped so far up my much watch list like that just sounds incredible and god how timely for 2018 for a film like that right yeah Yeah. beat the purge uh by a long shot yeah (laughs) uh one last mention though uh, another personal favorite uh dog soldiers by neil marshall uh which uh you know simple premise uh bunch of werewolves outside a house bunch of SAS soldiers inside a house and hilarity ensues but yeah no just uh, it was Neil Marshall's first feature uh, really well done uh, definitely in the vein of like aliens but yeah those werewolf designs are really cool and uh, the soldier characters are pretty well defined and you know just er- and almost everybody involved in the movie went on to work on Game of Thrones so uh, a lot of familiar faces there including Neil Marshall oh yeah yeah he did some pretty badass episodes of Game of Thrones whenever they needed a kick-ass battle they called Neil Marshall hell yeah they did and he delivered because yeah he has some of the more memorable episodes yep and he got his start with dog soldiers do we have any other uh, military ones or we want to move on to uh, to our topic I think we're good yeah let's move on our topic that we come up with is uh, is basically Netflix originals and what kind of brought this up we were we were discussing how uh, Netflix was removed from competition at the Cannes Film Festival because uh, it, it's always been a rule but I guess they uh, can started enforcing where they need a French theatrical run for movies to be eligible which Netflix doesn't do that. So Netflix pulled all their movies out, but they still went into Cannes with the intent to be big players purchasing distribution rights. And they did come away with a few titles, but a lot of filmmakers turned down Netflix's offer for other offers that weren't quite as lucrative financially, but that were going to give them a theatrical run. So it kind of got us thinking about what, uh, because we know that Cloverfield Paradox is kind of got dumped to Netflix and with good reason because it wasn't a very good movie but Annihilation rumor the rumor was that Annihilation was almost dumped to Netflix which would have been a huge mistake because Annihilation was a feeder movie and I don't think a feeder could have saved Cloverfield Paradox but I also don't think that I almost think that Netflix may have killed Annihilation if it was dumped right there because it just would have flown into the oversaturated amount of content that is out there and Netflix's user interface is not very user friendly. So, you know, and, and Annihilation has the alphabet thing going for it. If you're going through alphabetical, Mm -hmm. it's an A, but, um, 
it's uh, it's just kind of an interesting thing to think of that movies that get dumped to Netflix they really are kind of dumped to Netflix if you think about it and it's and it's not always the ones that they purchase a lot of you know that have like Netflix original in front of it a lot yeah. of it's just yeah picking up as much catalog as possible uh, through various deals with studios and distribution companies so that's why you do find yourself middle of the night going through like say the horror genre just and seeing tons of like the Amityville haunting or Transmorphers or you know Alien versus Hunter you know all these like mockbusters and just D movies and just stuff that you would maybe find for a dollar at a gas station DVD bin you know and you got a snakes on a train snakes <laughs> on a train another film from the asylum Atlantic Rim <laughs> oh god Grim Avengers you know let's just keep seeing how many asylum titles we can list off now um Thor Almighty <laughs> Sharknado 5 you know um but but it's true I mean there's just so much saturation with it and it kind of becomes daunting because how can you find something? I mean, every every I get shocked when I see a classic on there. Usually it's because I spent so much of my college years rating movies on it that it doesn't show me movies that I've watched before unless I go to watch it again. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, A Clockwork Orange is on here? Whoa, like when did they get this? You know, I mean, granted, I already own a lot of those movies on Blu-ray, but still it's insane the amount that's there. And um, so, yeah, it is a dumping ground, but at the same time, there are – getting new content on there and they are getting great content mm. i mean duncan jones's uh mute w uh premiered on netflix about a month or so ago and he's a great visionary director i mean moon source code those were fantastic films i still haven't seen warcraft but that's mainly of my disinterest with the video game more so than my disinterest in seeing a new duncan jones movie but he even went to twitter and uh voiced his not just a, not so much like anger, but more just kind of a little sad that they're never going to put it on DVD or Blu-ray because he's a physical media addict, just like many of us are. And I, and I agree. I mean, it's sad that on my shelf, there's a Duncan Jones movie that's missing and that's happening with all their movies because Netflix just puts their TV shows out on home video. I think they would might be taking it a bit more serious if they did stuff like that. I mean, it's great that we will always have access to it due to Netflix's streaming, but at the same time, there's just something about owning and holding something that I feel not only a lot of collectors like myself and a lot of uh, cinephiles feel, but filmmakers themselves feel that way as well. I mean, who can't, who doesn't remember that tear-jerking scene of Troll 2 when the director is holding a 35-millimeter <laughs> copy of his of Troll 2? I mean, the guy was a dick the entire movie, but that moment was so pure and beautiful. I mean, it really resonated. Well, one of my... Uh... One of I think who's who is one of the freshest voices in modern horror, Mike Flanagan. Um, you know he did Oculus and, mm -hmm. and Ouija too, but his last three movies were Hush, Gerald's Game, and Before I Wake. Yes, and they've all gone straight to Netflix in America, uh, in Canada. Before I Wake has a physical release, but yeah, you're you're not going to get physical. And Gerald's Game was one of the best movies of last year. Mm -hmm. And Netflix does do theatrical runs for some of their movies when they're trying to get Oscar eligibility. You know, they they pushed Oakja last year. They pushed Mudbound. Um, also, the Meyerowitz stories was another. You know, and and. You know, Beasts of No Nation a few years back. Yeah. You know, so they will do theatrical runs, but they're the barely qualifying, you know, week in L.A. or New York. I would love to have seen Gerald's Game in a theater just for the sake of seeing that one scene. And, you know, anyone who has seen it knows what I mean by that scene. Mm, yeah. But it would be one of those. Wait, which, it, it would be like. Which one? The, the I'll, I'll give you a hint. The glass. Oh. Uh, seeing, and, and, and it wouldn't be so much seeing that scene. It would be, I, I would probably watch the people around me to see, like, the, the second time I saw A Quiet Place, when the, the stairs scene that you guys know what I'm talking about, anybody who's seen it knows, yeah. I was watching the people around me to see their reactions. It would be the same thing with Gerald's game and that, and that glass scene. Um, because it, th there, there is an energy to that scene that I think would be amplified in a theater. I'm in two critics groups. I would love to have given Gerald's game, especially some acting awards, um, but they weren't eligible. 
because they didn't get theatrical runs, which is is kind of a shame that one of the best movies of last year, you know, I, I feel like Netflix for awards purposes kind of buried Gerald's game because maybe because it's a horror movie. But I mean, if, if you're familiar with the book, it's considered unfilmable. But then there's Flanagan, you know, Mike, hold my beer, Flanagan, mm. <laughs> who just uh, he, he filmed the unfilmable. I mean, it, and it's an incredible experience. And I wish the Netflix had pushed it a little harder theatrically so it could have gotten some awards. Although I don't know a single person who has not watched it on Netflix. So as far as that, you know, it's kind of like Cloverfield Paradox. It, it, it's a pretty bad movie, but genius marketing because yeah. it was the, the first commercial break of the Super Bowl, which, you know, was probably not cheap for Netflix. They said coming soon. And then you go and you check your Netflix to see when it's coming. And it says available right after the game, you know, that comes out of nowhere. And, you know, as soon as that counter went down to zero, people were going to Netflix to watch a Cloverfield Paradox. Yeah. No, I mean, the marketing was on point for that one, even if uh, the movie itself was a little bit more disappointing. And it got everybody watching on Super Bowl Sunday, you know, because you're watching the Super Bowl game and you see that and just like, Oh shit, I gotta watch that after the Super Bowl. Yeah, and I mean, it generated a fuck ton of hits. I mean, it was all anyone talked about, and it was trending for a good week or two. Granted, after, like, the first day, it was, you know, mixed to really bad reviews, but um, it was... <laughs> yeah, word spread fast, but for about 24 hours after it went live, it was the most watched movie on the service. Yeah, and, and it's... It really was incredible, especially with a franchise like Cloverfield, where we didn't get a sequel for, what, the better part of a decade at least? And then within like a year or two, there suddenly was one that dropped. I mean, that franchise has always shrouded itself in mystery, but it's also mm. one that walks a very fine line. Because especially with the sequels, it's well known that they don't start off as Cloverfield movies. I think 10 Cloverfield yeah. Lane even um, was completely finished when the idea to turn it into a Cloverfield uh, movie was made in post-production and they went back and filmed some bits to tie it into the franchise. So it's a very finicky uh, franchise. And I do believe that them not even dumping it, but putting it on Netflix and giving it that platform might have saved that franchise because if it was released in theaters, it may have killed it. And it's not so much saved it as much as it didn't let Paradox really get in the way of the franchise and it's i mean we already have supposedly a fourth film filmed and completed and is coming out i don't know i think jj abrams is gonna round the corner of my of my hotel and throw it at my face and then disappear <laughs> and smoke um, yeah last i heard it's coming out in october and it's called overlord uh although i'm not sure how they're gonna fit in uh a cloverfield title with at all but it sounds pretty interesting and it sounds really different because uh, apparently it's about a couple of soldiers who get uh, lost on D-Day during World War II and they go to this village where the Nazis have been conducting like magical rituals and screwing up with the area so as a fan of Michael Mann's The Keep I'm pretty stoked about that it's interesting because th there were rumors around that A Quiet Place was a Cloverfield sequel which it wasn't but you can see how if Platinum Dunes had not had as much faith in A Quiet Place, you can see how that could have, you know, they could have stamped Cloverfield, you know, a mm. Cloverfield Quiet Place. I mean, it looks like it could have taken place in the same universe. A oh, Quiet yeah. Cloverfield Place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a Quiet Place in the Cloverfield. <laughs> in the Cloverfields. Because uh, it definitely feels like it belongs in that universe. I don't think that the creatures would have been half as much fun if they had just subbed in the Cloverfield guys instead of the ones that they had. That's kind of like a joke around the film industry right now is like everybody is, you know, like like I, I think when people were theorizing that A Quiet Place was a Cloverfield sequel, the writer of The Big Sick had uh, tweeted something about The Big Sick was a Cloverfield sequel. Didn't you guys know that? You know, yeah. everybody was joking about, you know, they just slap the Cloverfield name on everything. It was. It was great to see Ray Romano in a Cloverfield movie for once. Like, <laughs> if any actor deserves to be in one, it's, it's you know, because everybody loves Raymond. <laughs> oh, that was a bad joke. Sorry. The thing about Netflix is the Netflix originals, um, quote originals, because a lot of them are just distributed. They didn't actually make them. They 
they kind of do just fall into they, they kind of get lost in I mean and they'll push some of them and I think Mudbound uh, getting a little bit of awards traction helped it out but they do end up getting lost in especially because uh, like I said the, the user interface is not very friendly and all you're getting is a, a thumbnail of the movie and if you look at it for more than two seconds the damn trailer starts playing which I uh, hate the worst. Netflix yeah, that, does that yeah I'm agreeing with you there that that is very annoying it's almost like a race. I'll be flipping through Netflix stuff. I have two seconds to decide if I want to hit play on something and then I move on to the next because I don't want that damn trailer to start. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is unfortunate that a uh, a large portion of uh, Netflix's streaming library isn't always top quality, but I feel like this is comparable to the video boom of the 80s and 90s where, you know, like a lot more stuff was going on to video because it was cheaper and a lot of stuff could go direct to video, cheap stuff they could shoot on video and put on video. But yeah, I, f- I feel like it's a lot of the same that, you know, like the home video market uh, just never really gets a lot of respect no matter what comes out on it. And uh, if any anything that era has gotten even better now with streaming like so many quality products that <laughs> no way in hell would have ever been put on vhs but yeah you know like one of my f- favorite uh netflix original horror movies was the ritual and yeah. you know like it, it goes to show that the format can be very liberating you know and just a lot of projects and stuff that couldn't otherwise get made uh could you know have a home on netflix or hulu or whatever on streaming so you know there's definitely going to be a lot of bad uh, movies and stuff in there but uh, if it allows stuff like the ritual to get made then you know i'm i'm all for it the ritual kind of dropped out of nowhere about a week after cloverfield paradox and mm. that was that was the mo- i mean not that they would have ever put that kind of i mean they were probably smart about it because no one would have watched the cloverfield paradox otherwise but <laughs> i think i feel like the ritual the ritual is a much better movie agree and they, they could have pushed that harder i mean i don't think that the ritual has done half the view as a Cloverfield paradox, but it's a way better, you know, the quality is way better on it. I know I'm kind of coming off as one of those, you know, guys who bitches about movie pass because you can't see the same movie more than once. You know, it's like Netflix is still an amazing deal. Yeah. You've got all this content at your fingertips for what I think it just went up to 11 bucks a month. You can't really beat that deal. And yeah, there's a lot of movies on there you haven't heard, you know, you haven't heard of. Roll the dice. You know, it's not really free, but it feels like it's free when you're watching it. If you don't like something in 10 minutes, pick something else, you know. (laughs) I mean, a lot of this conversation can be chalked up to first world problems. It's like, oh, no, we have too (laughs) much content available to us. But, (laughs) But also at the end of the day, it is having far reaching effects on you know, the industry and how we consume content as a whole. I mean, it's look at the economic ramifications of Netflix just purely existing and being successful. I mean, Blockbuster went bankrupt and is no longer mm-hmm. a thing except for like in a couple of cities in Alaska. Uh, other <laughs> mom and pop shops have closed. You know, it. it this is a major thing. And the way um, Netflix and other streaming services conduct themselves business wise does have a major effect. It's already affecting major film festivals like Cannes and how they uh, conduct themselves and how they bring movies in. It affects how we talk about films, how we consume content. I mean, um, Netflix dropping an entire season in one sitting, it changes how we consume things we used to have to wait week to week to watch what would next i mean uh, i know it was before my time but the season finale of dallas is forever ingrained in our culture because who shot jr now it's like who shot jr well i don't know i watched the whole season in one weekend a year ago i don't (laughs) remember what the fuck happened on stranger things a year ago it's the main reason why i haven't watched season two yet because i started watching it i was like i don't remember fucking shit there's a ball chick and D and D references, but that's an interesting point because do you think that binging hurts continuity like that? Like if you if you watch all the Stranger Things in a weekend yeah. and then you have to wait a long time for the next season to come out, is is that kind of a distraction? Because for me it is. Yeah. For me, when I've binged through 
something really quickly and then I have to wait for the next one. A lot of times I've lost interest in that series and I will have moved on to something else. I mean, I, I already w- said earlier, I have a pretty short attention span when it comes to TV anyway. I get bored with television shows very, very easily. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll put a hockey game on instead of watching, you know. <laughs> so, so it's interesting that you bring that up because cause I'm in the same boat. I, I haven't watched Stranger Things season two yet. And I loved season one, but I feel like I need to go back through season one just because it's been so long since I've seen it. You know, I need to refresh it. Right. And that's just a daunting task right now. It sounds like to me. No, and exactly. I mean, we're, uh, I know I have ADHD and I'm a part of the ADHD generation, you know, and that's a major part of a lot of how we consume things. And uh, I think it kind of does perpetuate it a bit, but also at the same time, Again, it's two sides of the coin. It's first world problems. Like we're, I'm bitching about the fact that I have everything at my fingertips immediately. Um, and it, but it's great because we still get amazing content out of it. I mean, how often do we talk about like the documentaries that come out of it? I mean, the the Duplass brother produced documentaries that have been coming on Netflix have been incredible. Wild, wild. Uh, country, country. Um, evil genius, evil genius. I mean, evil genius is incredible. I was talking at the beginning of this podcast about being stoked of seeing Cargo, which is a film. I don't even know if that would get it made if it wasn't going to be heading to Netflix. Like, why would an actor like Martin Freeman be in a zombie movie? You know, it's, unless it yeah. was something that was interesting that would get some form of platform where people could see it. So it's still an amazing thing, but we still have to recognize it just like movie pass, you know, these, these are game changers that are going to affect things. But again, we're still going to nitpick. We're still going to, like you said, bitch about only seeing one movie a day, only seeing that movie once, you know, though I was contrarian, you know, that, that is the thing though. Uh, I agree with Jonathan that these are very new, uh, formats and, you know, it's giving us a future of home entertainment that, uh, we, that is pretty unpredictable. So I feel like that we still should be critical and, you know, raise issue whenever needed. But, you know, it's, that's, you know, it's as the thing with ed- any, uh, advancement in, in entertainment technology that there's going to be pros and cons. Yeah. That's what a lot of people's problem with Netflix right now is they say, oh, their selection's not good. Well, I think Netflix has been putting more of its eggs in the original series, but, you know, yeah. the Orange is the New Black, the, you know, House of Cards. And, and then even like we touched on the documentaries, you know, Making a Murderer, they've been concentrating more on that. So, yeah, sure. If you try to find a movie on Netflix, you know, you have to search far and wide before, you know, and a lot of times, you know, I'll be looking for something on Netflix and after 20 minutes of looking, I'll give up. You know, <laughs> I'll like, I'll, I'll, you know, find a rerun of The Office somewhere. <laughs> um, but I think that the, the paradigm has shifted for Netflix where they know that Amazon Prime has got all of the old classic movies, so they don't need to, you know, they're going to go for their original stuff or their original TV shows. Amazon Prime also has all the old HBO shows that you can get, you know, so Netflix doesn't need to have The Sopranos or Sex and the City. I don't know, I just think Netflix is trying to carve out a niche for themselves that is moving away from just being a library of classic movies. Yeah. You know, and if that means straight to video, you know, movies that, you know, like like asylum movies, if if that means snakes on a train, <laughs> that means they, they've got snakes on a train, you know. Yeah, you don't have to watch it. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You just keep flipping by. And it goes comes down to the point, you know, I made earlier with The Exorcist. We have to talk about this. We have to share the ones that um, do have an effect on us that we do love. Yeah. We got to, sh- especially horror, we have to be supportive mm-hmm. of what we love. Because if we don't, Netflix isn't going to invest in the next Gerald's game. They're not going to invest in the next ritual. Yeah. They're going to invest in the next Bright. They're going to invest in another Cloverfield <laughs> Paradox type movie. They're going to invest in five more fucking Adam Sandler movies, you know, that are his paid vacations. That's what's going to happen. So as genre fans, we have to continue to talk about our favorite things. It's easy to talk about stuff that becomes a mainstream hit like uh, Stranger Things because everyone is everyone is watching it. But we really need to take the social media talk or even God forbid, leave the house and talk to your fucking friends about it and get them to watch these movies um, and TV shows. Cause that is what gets more of those made. 
and helps them stay on. So the moral of the story today is go out and if you haven't seen Gerald's game, fucking watch it. If you haven't seen the ritual, <laughs> fucking watch it. If you yes. find an interesting new movie, fucking watch it and then talk about it. Share it with your friends. What was the other one that cargo? No, the the other one was it Veronica? Was that the the one that the, the scarier than the Exorcist from about two months ago? Oh, that uh, that meme was killing me. Like it hurt my soul. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the one that like took the scarier than the Exorcist like way too far and kind of killed it for me. But hey, you Oof. know what? I'm gonna watch it because we need more movies. Uh, we need more good quality movies. I also want to know who the fuck is going to pick up MASH because I can't find MASH on any streaming service and it's pissing me uh, off. That is unfortunate. All right. Well, have we have we talked this one to death? I think so. Yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's get the hell out of here then. Uh, as always, our theme song is DMP, Death Metal Pope. And our artwork was by Chris Fisher. So uh, track them down and thank them for us. Uh, you can find... Uh, me on Twitter at Cinema Firite, that's F-E-A-R-I-T-E. And uh, where can we find you, Jacob? You can find me on Twitter at J-A-C-O-B-D-A-V-I-S-O-N underscore, that's at Jacob Davison underscore. And Korea, where can we find you on Twitter? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Korean Barbecue, that's C-O-R-R-E-I-A-N-B-B-Q. And uh, don't forget to also follow iHorror on Twitter and Facebook. On Twitter, we are iHorror News. And while you are at Facebook, go to our Facebook page for Ion Horror and uh, give us a like. And you can find all three of us there. If you don't do the Twitters or if you don't feel like tracking us down on Twitter, you can uh, communicate with us there. So let us know what you think. Uh, if we missed any of your favorite Netflix originals, let us know. Uh, so I'm James J. Edwards. I'm Jacob Davison. And I'm Jonathan Correa. Keep your eye on horror.